Is it my on yet? All right. All right. Way to go. Is that better? All right. Here we go. Yeah, clap for me. Take the edge off, right? Yeah. All right. And I got to tell you, I got so much footage. I'm making a documentary. I didn't know whether to call the, the ambulance because it looked like people were having seizures or what. I just didn't know. But, man, some of y'all, listen, you're not getting invited to future weddings because that was awful. Okay? So uh, just stop dancing. But it was good. Our, our student pastor's on his honeymoon, which means they're doing a lot of holding hands and eating breakfast, stuff like that. So they'll, uh, they're having a good time. We just need for them to rest because they really bust their tail. It's a, a lot of what we do. Uh, it's because of them, and they do such a great job. Uh, we're in a sermon series that we've nicknamed Gravity. We like to do that. We like to nickname sermon series because it draws people in, and we kind of stick to a theme. And the theme of Gravity is this. Is, it's understood that but we all come in here limping. We all come in here with a weight. And it's different from everybody's. And sometimes we think ours is so different from other people's. But no matter what that weight is, it's such a burden. It can weigh, really weigh us down. It can keep us from doing what God's called us to do or be in a relationship with Him. And God, what He does, and we're seeing over and over in Scripture, is that he, His love defies gravity. He loves those moments where He can come in. And that's, that's what He does. He gets glory from, from our situations and our circumstances. So uh, that's where we are today. And I just want to say something. I, I, I'm, God just won't let me read something. He's always got to illustrate it in my life. And a lot of times I get kind of tired of that. But, but he's, he's doing a good work in me, probably like He's doing you when you read His Word. Uh, I, was, I had to run to Bilo the other day. And I don't really, I'm getting to where I don't like to go out in public because uh, I love talking to people. But, you know, like five in a row for 20 minutes a piece, you know, I can't do that all the time. So, uh, it's, it's easy if I just go out of town and then go to the grocery store and drive back sometimes. But uh, I, I saw somebody I hadn't seen since probably the 8th or ninth grade. And uh, it was a female, and, uh, and, and it was nice to see her. It was a nice little reunion. But she reminded me of a situation, one of my first uh, experiences of thinking back and, and, and really having grace illustrated in my life. She was quick to remind me of this situation, if you know people like that. Uh, I was probably in the eighth grade or so. Like, you know where it is with your voices. It sounds like Shaggy or Scooby or one of them. And, man, I just, I just knew that being invited to this birthday party, this friend of mine, uh, was going to be an awesome event. It's kind of like a prom for people that might be a little bit older. It's like, man, I can't wait for this. I taught my mom. We didn't have a lot of money, but I talked her to buy me a turtleneck, if y'all remember those. And I had a, a turtleneck, and it had stripes on it. And I was borrowed my friend's gold chain. You remember the hair and bone? Those will probably come back. Some of y'all have still got them on. I'm sorry. I'm just, you're bringing them back. But you know, remember Sebago's? You remember the Sebago's? You, you know, yeah. And the braided belt that hung way down. That was me. I, you know what I'm saying? I, I, I did it way too long after that, but I, I won't go back. But I even had so much, I caught wind that this guy's sister was going to definitely be there. And that's what all this was for. And what I did, I was, I, I'd asked for my birthday in advance because it was about that time of year. I said, I overheard her telling somebody that she liked Dracar. Remember the cologne, Dracar? You buy in a gas station? Well, it, back then it was kind of big. And, and uh, it was about $10 more for the spray part. So I had to get the kind you do like this, you know. So I thought, I'll wear plenty of that. I got all my ducks in a row. I got my mustache was pumping. You know, a little thin mustache like she drew it on. So I was really ready for this party. Got me some new shoes. You know what I'm saying? You know, I couldn't really get shoes that often. But when I did, I like to take care of them. And so I thought, I got, everything's coming right in line for me. It's, it's, it's turned out to be exactly the way I thought it would be. And, and I thought things were just going to line up. And she was going to smell me and see me. And she would want to be with me. And she was the girl of my dream. Now, my woman of my dreams right here, right here. Is she in here? Yeah, there it is. That's her. This was a girl. This is a woman. So I was really ready for this moment, and man, I don't know what happened. It went wrong. Uh, I got let out of the car, and I walked in the house, and everything was fine. Everybody was glad to see me, and, uh, and I, I liked everybody there, and it was awesome. And about six minutes later, I guess, something went awfully wrong. And <laughs> if you know what I'm talking about, somebody did a, a shoe check. Who's got poop on their shoes? I, oh my God, are you serious? I, I just knew it me. He's new, and I'm looking right. I'm smelling good. Uh, and I, <laughs> I looked, and there wasn't nothing. I looked, and bam, there it was. And you know how you try to act like you didn't see it? Like, nope, nope. <laughs> By that time, I don't know if y'all are live in the 
very late 80s, but um, I don't know what was going on either with houses. The carpets uh, were everywhere. Carpet. Car- There's no carpet in our house, except maybe like an area rug. I know houses still do. I'm sorry. But even back then, my house, so I can say that, you know what I'm saying, where you can say it if it applies to you, yeah, is we even had carpet in the kitchen. You know what I'm saying? So there was, that's gross, isn't it? But this carpet, man, the walls were carpet. I don't know, but everywhere was carpet. It was doo-doo everywhere, <laughs> everywhere. I had tracked it everywhere. And, man, I don't know if you know if you've been there, especially at that age, man. When they found out it was my shoes, it was over. It was over. All, all of what I expected to be. And, man, people, you know, people just don't want to be around you when you got poop on your shoes, you know, or if you, if you were the, the, the feller, you know what I'm saying? So uh, I never forget. Uh, and I was supposed to not only go to the party but spend the night. And I remember calling my mom, and I was probably tearing up. And, uh, but the, the guy and girl, their mom, found out it was me. I guess she saw how bad I was hurting. She saw how bad it upset me that I wasn't expecting this. And that people actually went away from me. They didn't want to connect with me. I felt like a leper. Okay? And she did a, a, an amazing thing. She took my shoes. She told me it was okay. And she took my shoes and made them just brand new. Because they were brand new. I could, I, they're so new, I could have took them back to the store and they wouldn't have known the difference before the poop. So she had cleaned those things up and she had gone through the house and it took her all night when she should have been hosting. She was probably had a thousand things she should have been doing. A, a million things. You know, if you're hosting the kids' birthday party, you got a bunch of teenagers, that that's what you're doing. She was on her hands and knees trying to make it new again, okay? So that was my first experience way before I got saved, you know what I'm saying? But I, looking back, I remember, and I saw this girl in Bilo, and she says, yeah, I, mean, I hadn't seen you so long. Wow, what are you doing? And last time I saw you, poop on your shoes. So, okay, thanks for bringing that up. Y'all got people in your life that like to remind you of the tough stuff? Yeah. So that's where we are today, and uh, uh, I hope you'll, you'll see something in the, the goal for you today. My goal for you today is to see that, look, Jesus makes things new, okay? No matter how far you feel from God or maybe how far you are from God, nothing's out of his reach, okay? There's no prior event that disqualifies you from his love, okay? I hope you feel pursued already, even before you hear his word. And here's what we know. Hey, uh... We just know that when we read God's Word, man, people respond to it. It's crazy. It is crazy. All they've got to do is catch a glimpse of God's Word, and they respond. Whether that's asking Jesus into their life for the first time, I've never experienced forgiveness, or that, man, I've been saved a long time, but there's been no fire, there's been nothing in me. I'm not moving. I'm stagnant. I haven't moved in a long time, and boy, does my life need it. Boy, does my family need for me to be obedient to God. And we're going to see this today. We're going to see God move today. Okay? So, we're going to be in Mark chapter 5. And the verse that I know is a little dark in here is going to come up on the screen and make it easy for you. But look, you still need a Bible. There's nothing like cracking open that dead cow with the dead trees and just getting into it and reading it. Okay? There's something about doing that. I don't always use this. Just on Sundays. But I love doing it. So if you've got it on your phone, you've got you version. Look, we're in the 21st century. Download the app. It's awesome. You've got all the... The, the versions, okay? So I'll just assume you're checking your Bible, not checking Facebook, right? So uh, we're going to be in Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. And what you'll find if you're new to, to the Bible, you'll find it awesome that if you read chapter 5, all of it, it's brimming. It's, it's a capacity for these type of events where people that were far from God encountered God and their life was changed forever, okay? So it's, Mark chapter 5 is awesome for that. And the way we're going to start out is Jesus is, has just been asked to do something impossible by a very, very important person. He's somebody that would have kept up a church, a synagogue. He would have been re- uh, responsible for making sure it was clean, making sure it was in order, that the services ran well. His, this guy's name was Jairus. And in the community, if, if you're ever uh, uh, something like it that works in a ministry, you're, you're on a higher level already, okay? Not like us around here, but, but on a higher level, right? And so his child is dying and he risks his reputation this guy and he runs up to Jesus okay which is a big faux pas because you know religious people just uh, generally didn't like Jesus he cramped their style okay and we'll find out more about that but but Jairus uh, runs to Jesus and falls him and said look I got this major thing in my life and I need your help there's nobody else can help but you okay so he's in, already in the middle, mi- middle of being in a, in a miracle okay so I'm gonna start reading and we'll watch it unfold. 
In verse 22, we'll start there. It says, Then one of the synagogue rulers, okay, named Jairus, came there. Seeing Jesus, he spotted him, and he fell at his feet and ple pleaded earnestly with him. I mean, everybody's watching. Everybody's watching. My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. He was in a desperate situation. Things were looking bad. He was willing to abandon his reputation to go to the one person that he knew could help him with this situation. So the Bible says that Jesus went with him. And then it says, A large crowd followed and pressed him, pressed around him, and a woman was there who had been the subject of bleeding for 12 years. Now listen, Jesus always traveled with the entourage. I mean, his, his disciples, which were learning, you know, it was on the job training every day. And then the more that Jesus spoke and the more he did uh, uh, miracles and the more he, he did anything, man, people were just attracted to him. So wherever Jesus was, was a crowd. And if you're, if you're church hunting, I mean seriously church, not hopping, but hunting, okay? God's leading you somewhere. And if it's here, that's awesome. If it's somewhere else, listen, you can tell by if it's drawing people if Jesus is there, okay? Can anybody say amen to that? All right, some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Now, it says a large follow, a crowd followed Jesus. They pressed around him, and a woman was there who had been a subject in, of bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal. What this meant, she was hemorrhaging. Most scholars think it's a womanly kind of hemorrhaging. You know what I'm saying? The, the once a month thing. Uh, it could be otherwise, uh, but she's bleeding. Nevertheless, she's bleeding constantly. Uh, and it says she has suffered a great deal. This has caused her to be under a great deal of care of many doctors. I mean, everybody had tried to help her with this. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. And we learned last week, if you were here, man, that, hey, when God's going to do something, sometimes it gets better before it gets worse. But he promises that. He said, you know, I make all things new. So there we go. It says, when she heard about Jesus, when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and she touched his cloak. Because she thought, she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed immediately. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt, uh, she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around to the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see people crowding against you, don't you, Jesus? And his disciple answered, And yet, you can ask, Who touched me? They're kind of getting smart with Jesus. Look, you just don't get smart with Jesus. Okay? And he says, But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet. And trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. She told him everything. She confessed to him and told him everything that she had felt and what was going on. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Isn't that awesome? Okay, we're going to look at that. We're going to kind of dive in. We're just going to dissect it and see what this means. Okay, so we can see how it applies to your life and it applies to the life of other people. First of all, Jairus is a big deal. And a big, part, a big deal guy in the community, very important. Sometimes we feel that, that our situation isn't that important. Okay, especially considering all that God's got to do with other people. But we see that Jesus can't be interrupted. He is not interrupted with what's important to you because what's important to you is important to him. If it's way in heaven your heart, he wants you to, to interrupt him if that's what you think it is. Okay? So, here's what it says. It says a large crowd fought and pressed around him. Okay? And the woman there had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. And here's what happens when you bleed, however it is that you bleed. Listen. There's going to be some physical suffering. There's going to be a, just a discomfort, constant discomfort in your life. If, you, if you're bleeding a lot, you're going to be tired. We've probably got some uh, nurses and things in here of that nature. You're going to be tired. You're going to be pale. You're going to, you're going to lack energy. You're going to be fatigued all the time. It's going to be hard to drum up enough energy just to walk to take care of things that's going on. So she's having to live a life where she's suffering physically, okay? And the other thing is that... Uh, and what I think just sticks out here is she's, she's suffering socially. So probably about the, around the age of 12 or 13 or so, for the next 12 years up to this point, she's been constantly dealing with the issue of blood in her life. And it's already in inconvenient for women now. I mean, y'all probably haven't talked about this stuff in church before, but, you know, it's already, I'm sure, discomfort and, and, and all those things. But this woman's doing it constantly. And here's the deal. When you, she's basically a social leper. Because here's what would happen. You were, considered, you, you were considered unclean, 
okay? In the Old Testament, it talked about you being unclean if you did several, several things. One of those is if you touch a dead animal, okay? You'd have to go through a ritualistic process that took a lot of time, and, 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 and you, it, it would be such a chore to do, okay? And you would also be isolated from people. You would be isolated. This, this chronic condition means it's not going away, would cause you to be perpetually and constantly considered unclean. And you would constantly try to have to go through these ceremonies so that you could be clean. And here's what would happen. If you, if you had what had, she had going on, you couldn't just walk about freely. You were always handcuffed. You're always walking around, in most cases, having to either wear something that signifies, hey, don't get near me, because if you touch me, like, guess what? You become unclean. You know where I'm going? So, and in some cases, they would have to announce when they come somewhere, I'm unclean. So they would have to heavily depend on family members, probably resentful family members, that had to get involved in bringing food. They would have to, she would probably have been, have to resort to begging for food. And she'd have to stay on the outskirts of town, somebody with this type of illness. So she was socially isolated. She was considered unclean because here's what it says. Uh, in Leviticus, it says, if somebody, if a person, is Leviticus 5, 2 and 3, it says, if a person touches anything ceremonially unclean, including a person, whether it's the carcasses of unclean wild animals or unclean livestock or of unclean creatures that move along the ground, even though he is unaware of it, he has become unclean and is guilty. Or if he touches human uncleanliness, and that's what we're talking about today, is anything that would make him unclean, even though he is unaware of it, he, when he learns of, his, uh, learns of it, he will be guilty. Okay, just by association of people. So this means she probably wasn't married. Okay, no, nobody's going to want to marry a woman that makes you constantly unclean. And the talk of the town, you would be rejected. Okay, you're not welcome to go anywhere. And people would spit when they go by. That would mark their disgust with you. Literally spit on the ground to do that. So she suffered emotionally, no doubt. Uh, and, and so many people, and I'm sorry that you feel like uh, maybe... People in churches don't understand depression, but we have people, lots of people, the people in the Bible, so the main characters, if you're really reading your Bible, you'll see that they suffer from depression, okay? So many of them are willing, it's the main ones, willing, willing to give up, okay? They saw no end to their situation, and in some cases begged God to take their life. And so there's no doubt with a situation like this, she would have been, uh, probably had crying spells. She would have uh, contemplated suicide or hoping at least that she might have died. And she would also suffered religiously. She would not be welcome in a church. We, we committed from the beginning at Revolution Church. We want the messy people. We actually read God's Word to see that we as a church, that's what we're doing, is the doors are open, okay? To people that are deep into their mess, deep into their situation, but here she would have been isolated, which means she would have been disconnected from God. Okay? She would have been considered that unclean. So, here's what I want to catch. Every, I, try, I try to every week to try to give you some application points or just thoughts that you may, maybe would take home. Maybe you want to tweet them. Maybe you just want to come up with your own stuff. I love that. I love when people send me stuff back and say, man, this would be a good title for that. This would be a good application point. I love it. And this is my first one. This is my first one. To make the right choices... To make the right choices, we must listen to the right voices. Okay, I'll say it again. To make the right choices, we must listen to the right voices. Listen, somebody's got your ear. Somebody's got access to your mind. Who are those people and what are they putting in it? Because listen, are they pointing you to Jesus or are they pointing you away from Jesus? Because listen, every time, and this is for you, every time you talk about Jesus, somebody's listening. Somebody needs that hope. They hope you talk about it more. It's great that you talk about Revolution Church or whatever church you go to or been to, but they, they need to hear about Jesus. They want to. They want that hope. They want somebody that's willing to say something that gives them hope. And in this situation, to make the right choices, we must listen to the right voices. And in verse 27, it says, When she heard about Jesus, that means somebody was willing to talk, and she was willing to listen. She was desperate in her situation. Maybe yours isn't blood. Maybe financially you're in a situation you didn't think you'd be in at this point. Maybe your relationship is definitely not where you thought it would be or hoped it would be, especially at this point. Maybe you're ready to give up and walk away. But she overheard somebody talking 
that there's this guy named Jesus going around. Maybe she heard, hey, earlier in, in Mark, and, and it's, it's, uh, the whole book of Mark is awesome for that. Maybe she heard about that, that, uh, that crazy guy was running around naked and, and Jesus healed him and restored him. Maybe she heard about the lepers. Maybe she heard people talking about what Jesus did with people like her that were isolated in their community. And she heard about it. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. Because she thought, if I can just touch his cloak, I can be healed. Here's what I love, love about, I love about Revolution Church. I love it about new people that are coming and hearing Jesus for the first time. They just don't know. They don't know what the rules are. Amen? Ain't that good sometimes? The rules. And so I love it when they can just come in and worship worship they don't they don't understand apathy in a church yet they don't understand that those type of things they don't understand that church is supposed to be boring right and these and he, these these people they just go with what they know and the reason she thought one of the many reasons she could have thought that his cloak was so special is a lot of the rabbis would wear cloaks and at the end of the cloak they would have little tassels little blue tassels and that was to remind the people that wore those cloaks when they walked, the tassels would shake on the end. And it, with every step that they took, it would remind them of the law of God, like the Ten Commandments, okay? God, when I walk, I'm thinking about God. I'm thinking about God. So, you know, people on the outside that don't really know Jesus, they don't know the rules, they don't even, they don't even open a Bible yet. All they know is, I desperately need something. I, I'm, I'm in a desperate situation. And I'll do what I think I know to do. And for some of y'all, that'll be today. You're going to reach out to Jesus. You're going to want to touch him. You don't know what the rules are. You don't, you don't know any of that. You don't know Jesus yet, but you need something. And you, you have heard who has the answer, and it's Jesus. And she's, she's taking this literally. She's, she, she's risking it all here. She's so determined to get to Jesus because don't you know it's difficult to get to Jesus? A lot of times people make a barrier to Jesus, don't they? They create a fence around Jesus sometimes with the rules and the regulations. And like I said, I, I, I might have tweeted this week, is, uh, are you following Jesus or, or are you following the rules? And it's sad and makes me mad at the same time that, that people create such a barrier. You got on the wrong thing. That's not how we do this. This is not the way it's done. When Jesus just wants us to be so desperate that we come to him. And he, I've, never, I've yet to see him reject anybody. I've read the whole Bible. I don't understand it all. But I've, I, one thing for sure is Jesus doesn't reject. I love that love that so she's risking public humiliation here she could get stoned for this somebody that would purposefully and intentionally infect and make other people unclean she knew that that's what the risk was so she thought if I could just sneak up sneak in and touch Jesus maybe there's something that would happen okay and here's what I know I know about church and I, I want you if you're trying to follow Jesus you're dipping your toes in this whole Jesus thing and you're trying to figure out this is right for you and I'm not talking about the church I'm talking about Jesus sometimes people get it mixed up they get it twisted they think that if I can just be near Jesus if I can just show up something awesome will happen in my life if I just show up and sit and leave real quick and never get plugged in not fully reveal my needs to Jesus Okay? There's danger in that. It won't, this is awesome. What church plant in uh, two states has grown this fast that I know of. That's an authentic church plant. It just doesn't happen at this rate in 10 months. Okay? And what happens is people are willing to take that step. They're not just going to come and spectate. But what I know is if you run the risk, if you're just showing up and not doing everything that God's called you to do, it doesn't last long. It's got about a three or four week lifespan to it. So she was just going to try to show up and, and, and touch Jesus without him really knowing it, okay? So that's where she is. She's running the risk. And here's what Jeremiah 29, 13 says. It'll come up on the screen. Jeremiah 29, 13 says this. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. That's a promise. That's not just a statement okay that you'll find him when you seek him with all of your heart that means with man I am desperate here I need something to happen 
I want it. Nothing is in the way of that. I'm pursuing. I'm finding out everything I can. I'm not just dipping my toes in water. I'm diving in. And that's what he says. That's a promise. And I'll say it one more time. It should change your life. And that, that means that it says, uh, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. So, here's the next thing I want you to catch is there is power in his presence. There's power in his presence. It says, verse 29, immediately when she touched him, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. It was that powerful. It means to touch. And, and, and at once, Jesus realized that that power had gone out from him. And that, the word that goes back uh, for power is the same word we get our dynamite from. It means something went off. It was a, an obvious explosion of some kind. It was a power that was released that you couldn't ignore. And he turned around to the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? Well, that's when the disciples get pretty... I feel like Sylvester. I'm spitting everywhere. The cat. Uh, who touched my clothes? And when they got smart, they're saying, what are you talking about, Jesus? Everybody's trying to touch you. Everybody. And everybody's doing different things with Jesus. Some people are trying to kill him. They're trying to kill Jesus. He had to worry about that sometimes. Some people just want a free meal. They want a free meal. That's okay. Some people need a miracle. So they're coming to Jesus for different reasons. And he's saying, you know, I know, I know that somebody touched me. Yeah, there's a lot of people touched me, but somebody touched me. There was a connection. Just like this crowd. Yeah, everybody's listening to my voice. Everybody's listening. But somebody's listening. Okay? Somebody is intent on wanting to make a connection with what's coming out of my mouth, with what God's Word is saying here. Some people are just listening, but some people are listening. He said, that's what I... Somebody, everybody's touching me, but somebody touched me. And I felt it. But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Listen, Jesus, Jesus knows everything, and I've said this before, is he just is not good to play hide-and-go-seek with. He's not good at surprise parties. He's the guy you jump out, and he says, I already knew. You know what I'm saying? So you can't really do that. But there was something that he wanted. There was something that, that needed to happen, and Jesus allowed it to happen. She was healed. Her, her bleeding had already stopped. But Jesus wanted more than that. He wanted a face-to-face -face encounter. He wanted to hear from her. He wanted to hear what the deepest need in her heart was. And some of you limped in here today. You got a pretty smile. But there's something in your life you need that only Jesus can remedy. And he knew that. And he, he called her. And his goal wasn't to humiliate her. It never is to humiliate. It's to, I just want an encounter with you. I don't want you just to sneak in and pop in and, and go. I, I, want, I want fellowship with you. I want time with you. I want to know, even when other people don't, they don't want to hear it or can't understand it, I do. I want to be a part of that. And so he did. He said to her this, and I love this, okay? It says, because she's, she's probably too old to be his daughter probably. Yeah, I would say so, Okay. And he, he said to her daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. This is significant. And listen, remember, there's a big crowd around Jesus, so everybody's hearing it. So he's not just talking to her. Everybody's hearing what Jesus is about. This increases the pressure on Jesus. And remember, remember, Jesus is on his way to do a miracle. Jesus also knows that he's going to be nailed to a cross. He knows for those three and a half years, probably before, that I'm doing all these things for people, so you are not an inconvenience to him. And he's on his way to at least two things. He's, he's in the middle of one, and he's going to one, but he still has time to stop and respond to your deepest need. I love it. He calls her daughter in front of everybody. What that means is, I'm welcome. You've been isolated from people, right? You remember my little story earlier? Okay, you've been isolated from people, but I call you mine. You are my daughter. Okay, that is scandalous. Jesus has a scandalous love for you. That means it gets him in trouble. He's probably going to get you in trouble, but he loves you that much. You're worth the risk. You're worth the risk. Can you clap for that? Let's wake some people up around you. No, I'm kidding. I see you looking. I know you're not asleep. So he calls her daughter. He says, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. To me, one of the biggest obstacles to ministry is religion. I'm telling you, I said it a couple of weeks ago. I expected prostitutes and crackheads. Hey, I love you. Come, that's who we want. Hey, hey. 
But man, what I'm finding is more and more people saying, I'm limping in here, addicted to religion. And I can't see Jesus because of all I let get in f between us. It doesn't even matter. The only time I see that stuff I'm addicted to, that, that religion, when I read it in the Bible, is the people that hung him on the cross. And so they're coming in and saying, man, I, I got to repent. When you repent from something, God, I turn away from that. I turn away from this relationship I've been in. I turn to what you have for me that's better than that could ever be. God, I turn away from my addiction, Lord, and I want you to fulfill that need that I have. Whether that's porn, whether it's drugs, or whatever it is. God, you have that for me. And Jesus got so much more for you than religion ever could. Okay? You're chasing the wind if you're going after religion. So I think it's the, 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 one of the biggest obstacles to the progress of God's kingdom. And I wrote this for myself, but because it's all about the how, but according to Jesus, it's about the heart. The problem religion has with people is how they do it. Hey, you can't just run up and touch Jesus like that. You got to get an appointment. You got to go through all his people. You can't just run up and touch him. That doesn't even work anyway. Come on. Those churches, when they worship, when they have, it's too dark in there. That's, you can't do it like that. The music's a little too loud. Let me say something. I like the music loud. And I love, this is what I love, adults, uh, experienced adults that endure it because they like to see young people worship God. I thank you for that. And I watch you. I've seen you. Elder adults, when they're coming in here, they just love, they can block out the noise and even enjoy it in most cases because they like to see young people worship God. But religious people, look, they're obsessed with the how you do things. And what I see in this text and several others is, it's the heart. Jesus is, is, is it's all about the heart with him. Because he's saying, you know, when you come with me, you, she said, you have faith. It's not how you did it and you came up and tried to touch me, but I found out because I know everything. But I knew it was in your heart that you needed something that you were desperate for. And he doesn't care about the how, he cares about the heart. Can you catch that? So I love that about him. She knew she had to do something. I've got to do something. And some of you are in the same boat. I've got to do something. And you've tried so many things. The scripture says, scripture says that she had tried everything. She had used all of her money, all of her resources, all of it to try to satisfy this situation. It's okay. It's okay. I can see my tablet. I'm going to tell you a quick story. I got a patient, and schizophrenia is not funny, and I'm not laughing. I know you can't see my face, but I'm not laughing, okay? But I had a patient one time who was so, listen, part of schizophrenia is hearing voices, and, and, and uh, I'm a, a psychotherapist, what I do for a living outside of here, and uh, he was so, so tired of his circumstances, the voices and the paranoia. He felt targeted, like people were following him and stuff like that. It's not funny, but he was desperate. If you saw a look on his face, it's not funny. And here's what he was willing to do. He told me this story. I didn't know to laugh or cry or call the police. I didn't know. I said, well, in his name, and he's not from here, you wouldn't know him. He says uh, that he got a, it was a cat, a black cat, that he made friends with and was feeding. He liked the cat. But his grandmother lived in uh, lower Alabama, uh, New Orleans area, and a lot of folks down there are into voodoo, witchcraft stuff, spells. That stuff's real. I mean, it's people really doing that. And he uh, went on the internet, okay, and he found a spell that was going to make him invisible. So that, and he was that desperate. And it wasn't funny. But it was going to make him invisible so people couldn't follow him and keep track of him and take notes on him and stuff like that. He took a cat and the spell called for him to boil some water. I said, boil some water? He said, yeah. He said, you put the cat in the boiling water Okay, and I, on the morning it kills them. Okay, it's not me doing this. Don't be mad at me. This is okay, and it separates the fur and loosens everything up. And you're supposed to take the bone out, one of the bones. It's a specific bone to put in your mouth, and it makes you invisible. Well, he, the, the kind of funny part of it was he tried to do it in the oven. I don't know how you boil water in the oven, but uh, he did it. But the cat made too much noise and this and that and the other. But he finally did it. Well, apparently, he finally did it. And I said, well. What's his name? I said, uh, did it work? And he said, no. I said, why do you think? 
He said, well, I think I used the wrong bone. That's what he said. I was like, no, man, no. So the point, my whole point of that is saying, dang, man, this dude was desperate. He, he said, I felt really, really guilty because I fed the cat. I made it feel like I was his friend. I petted it a lot every day. He said, I felt so guilty about it. But he was willing to do whatever it took to escape what was troubling him the most. Isn't that awesome or awful? One of the two. It's all something. It was bad. So she had done that too. She, and, and the doctors we think about today in our life, these are not the same kind of doctors. Those were quacks. Those were people uh, who... Uh, those were people who were trying witchcraft. It's not like just medical doctors. They were trying everything. They were taking their money while they did it. And I can't help but think because I hear it and I see it. I've even been there myself. I will try anything. I will do anything to satisfy this deepest need in my heart. And Jesus said, you know, we don't have to do that. That's not what it is. And here, here's what I love. This is what I wrote down for me. He said, when he said that, hey, you're my daughter. I want you to go in peace. I accept you. You are made whole. You are made whole. You are made complete. You can walk guilt-free. You can walk in a new life. And this is what I wrote down for myself. Jesus doesn't just save you from something. He saves you for something. So while I'm talking about Jesus, man, he wants to help you with your deepest need. He wants you to do that. That's not where it ends. That's not where it ends. He's not just saving you from something. He's saving you for something. He's got something specific that he's already either probably already put in you that you don't know about or haven't responded with because you haven't handed your life over to Christ yet. But look, he's not just saving you from your circumstances. He's not just saving your life, rescuing you by offering you salvation. I've got more than that. I've got a plan through you to reach so many more people. Your life is going to affect the lives of others. So when I save you, I'm not just saving you from something. I'm saving you for something. I've got more plans for you got more plans for you and this is where we're going to end up I wish you'd stand with me I wish you'd stand uh, and we'll end up here's what I love about the lady you know when Jesus saves you from something he saves you for something. It, when you look back at your circumstances, the things that's got you nailed down, chained up, all of those things in a straitjacket, I wonder if she looked back at her circumstances and wondered if the strength was worth the struggle. If she somehow felt prepared because of her circumstances, maybe not now. Maybe not now that she felt or saw the purpose of the plan. But as she looked back and Hey, wouldn't, don't you think she would have appreciated when Jesus called her daughter that people began to try to connect with her again? She could then, because she's cleaned up, because she, her, she's no longer unclean, she could now go back to her family. She could now go back to her mother and father and her brothers and sisters and have community with them. She could have connection with them. They could actually hug her. How long do you think it was when, until she hadn't had a hug or a kiss or somebody that's willing to connect with her and be with her I bet it was a lot I bet it made her appreciate her circumstances even more I can't help but think that and so I think about you and my circumstances is after I go through this am I going to appreciate how God has delivered me out of this how he has made me new Am I looking at what he taught me through those circumstances? I bet she tried to connect with every person she could. I had a rough night last night. I had, uh, how many, I mean, if I actually raise your hand, you say, yeah, I've had a flat tire. How many of you had two at one time? That was me last night on the side of the road, 485 and 85, that little split. Man, I'm sitting in the rain. And of course, I got buddies all around me. It was awesome. I still got to wait on AAA. Two hours. So that now they're triple B, okay? I, they got demoted. And man, I, could, I just couldn't think about, I used to wouldn't do it. I'm like, man, this stinks. And it did. But God was in the middle of teaching me something, teaching me patience. Expectancy, I'm expecting triple A or triple B, whatever they are. But I got home, dead tired. Knew I had to be here this morning. Finally nested in at 1.15. And I said, you know what? 
I'm pretty thankful for the friends I have. I'm pretty thankful that I didn't die. And man, I'm, I expected to be out of that situation. I look back, God handled that. Not in my time, not in the way I thought it should have been done, but here I am in a warm bed. It's, things are pretty good. So he wants us to look at our circumstances as to, you know, it's not, I'm not just saving you from something. I'm not just coming to meet your need. I'm not offering to meet a need, a desperate need that you have just to, for the sake of saving you from it. I want an interaction with you. I want connection with you. I want fellowship with you. And in that same time, I'm preparing you for more. More than you can imagine. Some of your, your growth is stunted in your faith because you were inactive for so long. I don't mean going to church. Not just going to church, but responding to what God called you to do. I've been there. I'm there every once in a while. God wants that with us. And I, I wrote a few things that, you know, Richard, what do you get from this? What, is, what, what do you learn from this passage? And what, what have I been teaching you lately? Number one is, no one is untouchable. Some of y'all on fire, man. You are inviting people every single week. There's not a week that's gone by at this church in the 10 and a half, 11 months that we've been at this that we haven't had visitors. Most churches would kill for that. We're having people responding to the gospel or responding to God's word. The other one is, I said this earlier, is there is no prior event that disqualifies you from his love. There's nothing that you can come up with that Jesus can't handle. He wants that thing. That's the thing he wants. There's always the thing that we say we're giving to God, but there's always that really big thing behind it we don't really give up. He says, I want, I want that one too. I want that one. The writer of Mark wants us to see that our condition is not incurable. Same thing. There's a cure for what we have. There's a cure for what's going on in our life. But I don't know if you're like me. I, when I go to the doctor, I like to minimize stuff. But he can't help me with something I don't tell him about, right? So, but our condition's not incurable. Another thing is, the real issue of your life can only be remedied by the presence of God. There's certain things we squirrel around and try to do. If we can just save more money, if we can cut stuff here, if we can, uh, uh, if I just don't talk to my wife, it won't get any worse. Stuff like that. We need help in these areas, and we try to be as transparent around here as we can. But it's in the presence of God that true healing happens. That's what I got out of it. The last thing was this, that Jesus makes all things new. I think that's the common theme of every, we could say that every week. Jesus says, look, I make all things new. You think things are dead, broken, gone, unfixable, incurable? That's what I want. That's what I want you to put on my lap. That's what I want you to bring to me. And so many of you got it. You've got it and you've just lived with it for so long. It's almost normal for you. Maybe you've tried everything there was to try to this point, but you've run out of options. But you've heard about Jesus. You've heard it from this word. Maybe you've heard it from somebody on Facebook or talking about it. You've been invited. You've heard Jesus can do something about that. But you've got to make a move. You've got to make a move towards God. You've got to be desperate. You've got to be determined to bring that to Jesus. And here he is. He's in this moment. The appropriate response to Jesus is always a response. It's not inactivity. It's not passivity. That's why he tells us to follow him. It's a go, it's a move, it's a get out of where you are. There's a step involved, there's steps involved. She could have been healed, I guess she could have walked away and just not said anything. But Jesus wanted an encounter with her. And she, the Bible says that she told him the whole truth. She laid it all out to him. Look, I'm not that person, you don't have to do that to me, but you can do it with him. He says when you do it with your heart, he notices that. He's not concerned with the how you come to him, but it's that you come with your heart. He said that, not me. So if you'll close your eyes, this is an extremely important time. Just bow your head. It, that helps to just block everything out. And I really feel like, man, this is a decision that you will make if you'll make it and plan to move. That your future self will thank you later when you face God. When it comes down to it, nobody else around you will be there. It'll just be you and God. 
And your future self will, will thank you. Say, man, thank you for making the decision that day to take your next step. First, whether you're saved or not, I don't know. You just got things on your plate and they're piling high. There's de desperate situations you may be even given up on. Would you raise your hand? Just let me know. Just so I pray. It's not an embarrassment. Yes, take it to God. Your hand's really telling God, I I, this is a desperate need. Thank you. You can put them down. And what I assume about you raising your hand is, I need help. I can't do it on my own. And I just want to pray for you. I just want to pray for you right now in your circumstances. And I'm adding my personal prayers with that. Is this, is this. Follow along with me as God. Uh, we don't know how you do things or in what time frame you do them. But we know you do them. You're always active. You're always working on our behalf. And God, you're orchestrating events and you know everything that's going on. God, we trust you with that. But God, what you expect from us is to bring things to you. You want that relationship with us so we can come to you with what concerns us the most and what burdens us the most. And God, so many people raise their hand. I couldn't even count. And God, I'm right there with them. God, there's things in my life that only you can handle. God, I want to put them in your presence. I want to bring them with confidence that you're going to respond, God. And you're going to lift that burden. You're going to lift that weight. God, but in the meantime, while you're working, whatever it is you do, God, we're going to be patient. And we're going to be faithful. God, you're urging us to take steps. You're urging us to connect with the church, to connect with the life group, to start giving, to start serving, God. And not just being passive, God, because passive faith is no faith. You're clear on that. So, God, I just pray for these people that raise their hand, God, that you would enter things into their mind and into their heart, God. It would give them peace and they'd be willing to follow you wherever you go. And your eyes, please be closed. This is a very personal moment. Listen, we expect at this church, we expect every week, we know it, we want it, we expect it, that, man, there's always going to be people that don't, that haven't been saved yet, that haven't experienced that. That comes with the kind of church we are. It comes with the age of the church we are. We attract new people. And our whole goal was to attract people that, man, hopefully never even stepped in church before. We want to be a part of that process. Everybody's eyes are closed. Everybody's, please. If you've never experienced that forgiveness that Jesus offers, you just hadn't thought of it to this point. Nobody's asked you before. You've never felt this drawn to God before. But you'd like to hand over your life to Him because you're hearing that He's the one that can change it. He can make all things new. He can find something that's broken and He makes it new. Would you raise your hand just so I know? Thank you already. Thank you. Fake me out. I want to pray for you. And if you'll follow along and listen to what I'm praying about, maybe your prayer will sound something like this Father, I, I don't know what to do with my life. I've never been in a situation before, Lord, where I felt so drawn to you, God, but today I give you my life. I understand that it is broken. But God, you created me for so much more than what I'm living now, God. I ask you to forgive me of my sin, things that keep me separate from you. I recognize that my life and the way I've lived it has kept me separate from you, God. But now I see hope. I see the need to repent. That is to turn away from what I'm doing, God. But that you already love me. You've already forgiven me, God. And this new life is for me. I thank you for dying on the cross, the only acceptable sacrifice, God. And that, you, that you died and that you bled and that you rose again, God, to give me hope that you have power over death and life. God, I give you my life today. Give me a step, Lord. Give me the next step, and I'll take it. Thank you for giving me, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Give a hand clap to people that decided to give our life to Christ. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. Listen, we want to celebrate with you. I already know your next step. Jesus said, I know what your next step is. When you see me for who I am and you want to give your life to me, it is to be baptized. I want, the first thing I want you to do is to be baptized. Because we figure if we can 
If we can get you to take that step of baptism, that first step of faith, you're going to take another. You're going to start getting some swag on you, and you're going to want to take another one. You get bigger and bolder in your faith, and man, it's just going to erupt. And you're going to help us because this, this fall, and it's just a couple weeks away, September 9th, any church that's starting a church or planning a church or starting a new campus, they always start. The rule is do it the day after Labor Day because when people get into their routines of school and work and all the routines. And we know that our window for our next growth is going to be from September the 9th to Thanksgiving. God has resourced us, been very generous to us. And our people has responded to his generosity with their own generosity. And we've been able to make connections in the community, partnerships, so that we can explode during that September 9th to Thanksgiving. We've got things planned, we're doing, we need you to serve. We want you to serve. We're going to open up opportunity for you to make your life count. God calls us to serve. You're not being faithful if it's a passful, passive faith, okay? And so we just want to plug you in, and we, we believe so much in it. We think we run some people off, but we think we catch people too. We think we catch them, and they say, man, I know God's calling me to serve. I love that this church is about the community. I love that, these, that they're about serving. I'm down with that. We do it, okay? We're all over. So we've got life. I'm going to let Sally explain all that, but uh, we've got a connections table out here she's going to tell you about. It. I, can't, I can't hype that up enough. You need to stop by. So I'll let, I won't steal all of Sally's announcements, but I just want to celebrate one more time. People give their life to Christ. All right. I'm going to pray. I'm going to kind of shut my mouth so I can get out of the way so your worship pastor can do what he does. And that's going to lead you into worship. There's something to respond to. Maybe it's hope that you have or a need that you have. He's going to lead you into it. The words will be on the screen. Maybe that's your step. I need to worship. I've been withholding my worship from God. What he's created me for, I haven't been doing. It caused you to worship. Now here's the other big deal. There's going to be some people over here. They've already said, I want to do this. Please put me there. They're going to be on this side of the wall in just a minute. They're going to make their way when we start singing. And there's maybe something that you have a desperate need for. And they're not magical. They just love to pray with people. They believe in prayer because prayers were probably worked in their own life. Okay? And they want that for you as well. I'll be over here doing the same thing if you need me. But I'm no more special than them. Okay? They're equipped. They know what they're doing. But I'll be over here if you need me. And I'm going to be worshiping too. God, I want to worship you. Man, even though I had two flat tires and I stepped in that poop, I'm going to, you know, God, I'm, even when those things happen, God, I worship you. Because that opens doors, doesn't it? Okay. So let's pray. God, thank you, God, for saving lives. Even my own, God. Thank you for, God, not overlooking our sin, Lord, but dealing with our sin, Lord. We repent. Put things in our mind and our heart right now, Lord, that we need to walk away from so that we can have a connection with you, God. I thank you for life saves again, Lord. Help us to never be a church that gets over that, God. And Lord, put on our heart what our next steps are, Lord, as we worship you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.